Hello and welcome to a little bonus segment. Uh, I don't normally do this, but I've been interviewing Dr. Paul Harrison. Here he is. Hi. Hello. And um, and uh, we actually we strayed into some interesting territory. Um, he's an Egyptologist, and we were talking about the power of uh, of especially the imagery of ancient Egypt. And it, it, it got interesting, but I think we, we didn't necessarily want to just sort of shove it into the interview. So, so here we are recording some, some thoughts which you guys might find interesting at home. And I certainly find very interesting in so much as, and I think we were just saying off camera before we decided to record this. Um, this is actually one of the most powerful things that archaeology has to offer the, the modern world, I suggest, uh, in terms of identity and this kind of thing. So, um, so uh let's yeah just to sort of get get the ball rolling on this a little bit um ancient egypt very powerful imagery yeah now uh it, <laughs> burr, that goes without saying <laughs> i suppose <laughs> really um but in particular you went you were mentioning uh the bust of nefertiti yeah. yeah yeah so i mean um one of the things about egypt being this cultural headliner is that it's very prone to cultural appropriation mm. and that's happened through various different means from different groups over actually kind of many centuries, not just the last kind of several few decades. And it's particularly noticeable in the last several few decades, of course, because of, of mass media and the dissemination of it, uh, dissemination of images and the printed word, of course. Mm -hmm. So the Buster Nefertiti is a, a particularly interesting case because it, it epitomizes one of these fiercely contested ancient Egyptian images and it highlights the manner in which the ancient material and its meaning and context takes a back seat to how a modern narrative is projected onto it to its own ends. And the mm. most striking example of this is taking an ancient Egyptian sculpture, this in this case being the bust of Nefertiti, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this being used and promoted by Adolf Hitler during the Second World War as the epitome, in his opinion, of mm. the ultimate Aryan, mm. the ultimate Aryan physiognomy. Mm. And, 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 and yes, I suppose I find, what I find fascinating there is that there are, uh, I mean, I, I was aware of this already, but we were talking about how there are also groups at the could not be further from that end of the mm -hmm. spectrum in terms of for example uh, people who who are strong proponents of african culture and you know a powerful african identity yep. who also identify with that symbol um and, and that and that that visage as you know uh, uncontestably a beautiful face mm -hmm. but at the same yep. time certainly not aryan exactly I mean, I, exactly and it highlights i think it highlights how subjective um the practice of trying to project modern notions of racial superiority, uh, mm. how false that actually is, or how constructed that actually is. Because mm. for starters, our notion of race doesn't translate to the ancient world at all. No. In the ancient world and in ancient Egypt, and even in ancient Greece, where writers were known to highlight differences, race wasn't the concern nationality was the concern yeah um, so, so for example they, they would talk about uh you know ethiopia and ethiopians were mentioned in the ancient world yep, yep. but it wasn't because of their skin it was because of the kingdom that they came from exactly right exactly right so differences mm. would be noted but they weren't mm. they weren't a source of any kind of in our understanding any kind of social judgment or status so mm. in egypt if you were egyptian nationality mm -hmm. um it absolutely had no bearing on your standing what your skin color happened to be or you know what part of africa you may have come from or whether you came from the middle east in some cases or whatever once you were naturalized and you were egyptian you were egyptian uh, mm. and that was the important thing and so when you when you have modern groups trying to project race backwards it creates a false equivalency in some senses mm. now that's not mm. to say that there wasn't a, a very full range of races represented um, you probably wouldn't get someone as, as fair-skinned as myself 
uh, <laughs> in ancient Egypt. Uh, I'd certainly be very sunburned if uh, if I were there now. But um, actually, that 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 was the question that did occur to me in the interview. Yeah. Like, how do you how how do you handle Egypt? <laughs> so, like, my wife sunblock and a um, wide brimmed hat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I go yeah, out so, at so, night. Go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, are you a looter? No, I'm just a just a very pale archaeologist. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, so moving forward, sorry. So in terms of there was a rate, uh, there's a full range. Yeah. So there's yeah. you know there's there's obviously a um, there's a there's a real range of of uh, ethnic types represented in modern Egypt, and mm. it seems that there was a real range of it was a you know ancient Egypt was a, a cultural mixing pot par excellence in the ancient world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know we know for a fact. That there were, you know, ancient Egyptian pharaohs who were what we would consider um, African, deep black skin, uh, you know, or, or Nubian, and mm -hmm. uh, there were, you know, a real there was a real range of Egyptian racial types, but they didn't think in terms of race, and that's the real lesson mm -hmm. there is that you know we we have to be very careful about the kinds of projections we make on the ancients, because more likely than not, they weren't things that the ancients themselves would have been concerned with, or we are misinterpreting or misrepresenting what those ancients are. And I think you know that that can't be more epitomised really than the the uh, the idea of Nazis trying to promote Nefertiti as a symbol of mm -hmm. Aryan phenotype, which of course she absolutely can't be, having been an ancient Egyptian. So yeah, yeah. Well, actually, uh, uh, I mean, it's interesting there because something uh, an equivalence which kind of turned up when we were recording our interview was that that occurred to me was that, you know, for example, Julius Caesar had zero interest mm. in propping up a twentieth century uh, man such as Mussolini or something like right, that. Right, right. The yeah. it, it, and but also at the same time, not not only is is it a case of people didn't have this sort of teleological forward looking agenda you know oh, well, well, at some point we're going to be on top of the world um or trying to be on top of the world but also at the same at the same time as well it's interesting how in many respects um there, there has been continue a continuum continuation from the ancient world and for example one of my interests or one of the one of one of the one of the uh, uh the case studies that i use to try and interrogate this this question is this idea of celtic identity and what that means and you know for example being from North Wales myself, you know, people, I grew up with people making very strange assumptions about me, especially when I had like Damien red hair as a child. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, must be Celtic or son of the devil. Um, <laughs> but, but, um, uh, but actually, in all seriousness, um, actually interrogating some of these assumptions, uh, I think is one of the most, one of the most interesting things and one of the most one of the most, I suppose, productive, but also most difficult coal faces that archaeology works at. Absolutely, and I think it's an area where we um, we can really bring, help try and bring some arguments to the table and help maybe bridge some chasms. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, when I was when I was studying my master's degree, I became very interested in the way in which the Afrocentric um, community were looking at Egypt as an aspect of the history of the Black Diaspora. And this is yeah. to say that you know um, Egypt is used within those uh, within those works to promote the idea that you know black civilization had something to offer the world mm. that goes beyond um, the Western kind of white cultural narrative, and that's a really interesting argument because of course you know Martin Bernal really brought this to the forefront with with black and black Athena, and um, and even though certain elements of his argument have been kind of variously deconstructed by different uh, academics, what he did was highlight something very important, and that was mm. that the narrative that archaeology and the classics had been telling about the history of the world was very one-sided, and there was another side to the story that needed to be mm. told. And so I think, well, it, uh, uh, but but it was also it was also sorry it was yeah, also we, constructed constructed by those people. Yeah. For those people. Exactly right. So, 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 for example, a really, a really important example here would be the way in which uh, Augustus encouraged. I think didn't he? I think he commissioned, in fact, people to start thinking about Rome 
as having had direct connection with Troy, mm. and and you had uh, you know, certain people and certain connect, you know, writers and poets, artists, sculptures, it created to create this image of of someone passing on a torch of yep. civilization. Now, yep. uh, and, and that was specifically for him and his people to to have a sense of identity. And so, and in that sense, this is a, this is the, and this is I suppose what I was just touching on before. This repeats over and over, and we always yep. do that. And so, for, like a key one, I think I mentioned off camera to you before, would be for Britain, would be, for example, the Blitz Spirit, yep. this kind of thing. At the moment, that's a big, a big touchstone for us, uh, right or wrong, or, or more to the point, sorry, uh, unnuanced, as, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, uh, you know, as you say, there are other ones where um, which which are much more destructive, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, frankly, arguably, I think the Blitz Spirit is quite destructive, actually, but but. Um, in, in so much as the way in which we, we tend to, again, we're telling ourselves only the best of what we want to see. Mm. And, 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 and maybe actually what this, this coal face I sort of touched on is, is, is trying to not so much destroy straight line comparisons between say me and a Celt or, uh, or, you know, or someone in, in Africa and, and an ancient Egyptian, but rather just talk about maybe the service that we can provide is actually talking about the blurry lines, the, yep. the crisscrosses, the yep. fact that actually this is a, a complicated, matted web. Um, well, I think one the, of the, the, you're exactly right. And I, I think one of the important things kind of to bring to the table about this is that it is a very blurry web and it's an mm. inclusive web. Yeah. So, you know, while studying uh, the Afrocentric take on ancient Egypt, the things I started to realize were that, well, actually, there is a very potent argument for there being a strong African lineage within Egypt at the origins of Egyptian civilization, particularly when you're looking at the you know, nomadic herders, etc., who were um, coming into the Nile Valley to settle. And there's, there's, I think, a much more inclusive picture. It's not one thing or the other. As you move through history, you see how Egypt becomes this really fascinating melting pot of people from Africa, the Near East, and the Aegean and the Mediterranean. And you start looking at all these groups interacting and creating their own kind of narratives of what Egypt is and what it's supposed to be. And our own historians taking these on board and then taking them at their word in some cases. So we look at the Greeks and the Greeks say, we got this from Egypt, when of course they didn't get it from Egypt, they got it from half a dozen other places and synthesized it into something uniquely Greek. And yet, you know, culture historian, kind of early Egyptologists would take them at their word and say, oh, they got this from Egypt, therefore Egypt must have an equivalent. And the downside of that, of course, is when those people discovered hieroglyphs and how to translate hieroglyphs, they were disappointed because they had a preconception of what Egypt was supposed to be because they'd listened to the Greeks and taken them at their word. Mm. Uh, the important valuable lesson in that is that in the ancient world and even in the modern world, people refer back to something more ancient to give it a sense of legitimacy. And you see that with mm. the parties, political parties are still doing that now. They refer back to something ancient to give themselves some form of legitimacy. and you know, it's standing on the shoulders of giants, isn't it? But if we always mm. take these people at their words, I think you'll find that once you dig down into the truth of it, you'll be A, disappointed and B, confused, because the story is much more occluded um, and, and much more complex uh, than anyone really wants to admit. And it's not all just one set of people doing one set of practices. It's a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of really fascinating things and interacting with each other and not judging each other on, you know, uh, skin type or appearance or this or that or the other. It was, you know, um, in Egypt especially, it was you are Egyptian, therefore you have an Egyptian identity, therefore you can contribute to this society. Mm. That was it. Well, and actually, and what's, what's interesting there is, uh, well, two thoughts occur. So the first one I'll just sort of, add to that last thing you just mm. said for example in the roman world they had a very interesting approach to what we would call multiculturalism mm. in so much as if you as long as you behaved roman where you had to right <laughs> you could do what you wanted to at home you could bury yourself or no bury bury yourself you could be buried in <laughs> into what do you do you in your buried... free time <laughs> <laughs> mrs soup and i have a complicated relationship um <laughs> No, uh, you, you you could be buried in 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 traditions which weren't um, 
you know, Hellenistic in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, just so long as you were, you know, being Roman uh, in public life. Mm -hmm. uh, this is especially potent in places like North Africa and also, for example, in, in places in Britain as well. Um, so there's that. But actually, beyond that, I mean, you mentioned this idea of standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating there is, yes, standing on the shoulders of giants, but more to the point, giants which we have formed for oh, ourselves. Construct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and so, and so it says, it, I think that, again, yet again, it comes back to this question of actually helping people not only to think to imagine themselves standing on the shoulders of giants, but actually helping them to understand that the, that the giant that they think they're on is not only different, but also probably a Siamese twin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and probably probably actually slightly mutated version of what they think. Yeah. Um, and and I, I don't mean to get... I don't, that doesn't mean that, it, that, it, that it's an ugly thing or that somehow I'm trying to, to destroy people's sense of identity and the connection to the past. But the fact of the matter is, it's not. It's just not simple. Oh, and and I, think, I think that's one of the most powerful things which, which archaeology can bring, uh, should bring to the, to the plate. And yet, and sorry, I, and I'll just sort of... I'll, I'll let you come in back on in yeah, this yeah, one. Sure. Um, and yet, when it comes down to a personal level, I think we all struggle to do that. You know, for, so for example, mm. I know individuals who are very erudite, very aware of human history, but they still talk about themselves as essentially, or oh, essentially, I'm just, I am just Irish, or I am just, you know, it's, it is a hard thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's something, you know, in the same way that imagining time depth of human history is very difficult. It's not easy to pull yourself out of a narrative that you've that you you think you're part of. It's, yeah, yeah. it's it's difficult. That's the power of stories, and I think that's if anything, that's where the, the most critical lesson is. And it's a cliche, but I think it's a cliche which people kind of acknowledge, but don't actually necessarily let live in their minds. And that is that you know the mm. the past is constructed in the present. That's really mm. what archaeology is about, and that's it's a very important thing to remember when talking. Um, particularly politically about the past, is to remember yeah, well, well, that these are modern sorry, constructions, yeah. you know? Mm, we we mm. will always kind of write them with the angle that we want or what that particular mm. group wants. Mm. So, Well, and what's interesting there is that I once heard a, a, a very amusing comedian talk about, um, we always talk about, about the future, about our children. And he's like, the future doesn't exist! It's, it doesn't exist, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, it's not real. Yeah. In the same way, the past is not real. And, and all we ever have, really, as human beings, is this moment of, of I suppose, self-reflection, projection, mm. and, and in that sense, uh, to the, the extent to which we willfully or, for a lack of better understanding, deceive ourselves about what is before and what is yet to come. Uh, it, it's a fascinating notion, and, and it's 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 one of the things where, which I'm, I'm glad we took a, took a moment just to clarify, outside of the interview that we did, mm. what we were getting at, because actually, uh, you know, the, it's, a, it's a it's a touchy topic. Mm. It's a topic that lots of people, some people may not want to engage with, yeah. us, and that's fine. That's fine, you know. Um, but it's it is it's fascinating, and I'm I'm, I'm so happy that, that we were able to sort of pull that out, pull that apart a little bit. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. And I mean, we you know we do. We, we risk straying into some really interesting metaphysical territory when we talk about the passage of time, obviously, because it's only humans mm -hmm. that experience, or rather, you know, living creatures in this planet that experience time in a linear manner. And, and, and at a quantum level, we're starting to understand that time is not just linear, actually, that it's all happening. Mm -hmm. And we just happen to experience it this way. Um, so... Um, we're at great risk of running into a really deep rabbit hole there, though. I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to leave it there. I, I, last thing I want is people just going, "All oh, right, so he watches a program with Stephen Hawking." You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. No, no, no. But you, you're right. The, yeah, in that sense, actually, uh, there is, there is space there to acknowledge as well. This, the, the fact. I mean, I, actually, I suppose bringing it to a realm that is firmly within our expertise. Mm. Uh, phenomenology is a sort of ex an expression of that. The way in which the world reveals itself to you yeah. is in in many ways entirely subjective, but also, you know, the 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 the, the things that we're starting to understand about reality mm. is that actually this some of this stuff is not si again. It's not simple. It's not simple, people. No, it's not. Um, at you know, all. it's not simple. Um, anyway, like I say, thank you so much uh, for just taking this extra time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. No, lovely being. Thank you. Thank you.
Excellent. And uh, hopefully you guys at home appreciate the sort of extra thoughts because we just wanted to take it out, pull it apart, examine it, and, and crucially, not just sort of blindly walk down an alley where we're talking about Hitler because, you know, yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, that, that deserves careful, careful thought and attention. Very sensitive area of topic, and one which a lot of archaeologists, you know, don't necessarily, understandably, want to uh, approach very often. No. Um, no. Because these things uh, are still politically sensitive today, obviously. Yeah. With but good hopefully, reason. Yeah, well, with, with very good reason. But hopefully, by just sort of taking it out of that, we've made clear that that, that this is a... Essentially, this has been a thought bubble, mm. and we've been mm. talking about things within that bubble. Um, anyway, guys, as ever, until next time, do take care. Bye-bye.